Yo, hello, hello, welcome to the elephant in the room. My name is Aaron and this is the third part of the chapter Moving Stuff and People Around of the book The Money Game and Beyond. So, welcome back. Let's get into the business now. Let's try to unwrap this economy and see how it works. So first, let's remember how taxes were imposed on land or on safety. For example, if I have a piece of land and I tell you, you can raise your cows there, but you will have to give me a percentage of your earnings. That also happened in other scenarios, like in this example. Those guys are saying we take care of the ship when it's in the harbor for a 12% protection tax basically and those guys are saying we take care of the ship with an 11% protection tax. So out of this new practice the mighty world of business was born. Competition and differential advantage arising from playing around with the rules. Now try to imagine how these rules quickly evolve and in so many different directions. For example, we can heal you for only 3 coins, but we can only do it that cheaply because the tribe we are in offers protection for our services at only a 2% tax. Health providers tax the people while the tribe taxes the health providers, but for different reasons. Some of these taxes became mandatory, some not. Also that they could use the collected taxes to afford more stuff to sell to the tribe or improve the army or whatever. It basically evolved into taxes on taxes on taxes on taxes applied to rules that apply to other rules that apply to yet other rules. And that maze was made by people or groups to create advantage for themselves. And you know, I'm from Germany and like Germany is known for this craziness of bureaucracy bullshit, so many paper bullshit stuff that people have to deal with. Think about all those jobs that have to deal with only paper bullshit basically, insurance stuff. Just fucking give people free insurance and that's it. So nobody has to like do some bullshit paperwork or sit on the computer and deal with those bullshit things like just give people free access to healthcare and that's it you can make it so much more efficient and easy but let's keep going <laughs> like, that is still the idea behind taxes and businesses like these days you may be paying for your health insurance as a tax not as a service which means mandatory where you are basically coerced to add coins to the tribe's master coin bag a little bit each month and from these coins the tribe can pay the health providers to get you healthier without you paying them directly. Or the tribe may do something else with your tax money, build roads, different kinds of buildings, organize nonsensical sport events, ghostly invest in themselves and so on. So basically what you have to keep in mind is that all of these complex taxes and rules have more to do with how we can make more money than anything else. And then you can also watch that video to yeah, learn more about it. Another example of business is investing. Basically the idea behind investing is to get more money but with less risk. So basically with minimizing your risks. We can think about a startup. Let's say there is a new startup company, a new beverage company and they sell some sort of energy drink or some exclusive beverage. And what we can do now is we can invest into that beverage company and they can use that money and invest into more infrastructure and into advertising, marketing and so on. And then they yeah, can grow their revenue and sales and so on. So there are two ways of investing. Basically I can lend my 1% to that beverage company which translates into that beverage company owing me that 1% plus interest. So that's the simplified idea and we can call that a bond. And then in another scenario I can actually buy a part, a stock of that beverage company and that allows me to partake into like that beverage company ownership which means profits from the company will come to me as well. 
And I think if you buy a lot of stocks in a, from a company, then you can also take part in the decision making and so on. And this is what Wall Street does basically. Many people look into how monetarily valuable each company is. Basically they look at like a lot of graphs that show statistics from the worldwide market and then buy or sell parts of them or invest in them through bonds. This is how companies can grow or even lose value. Like if a rumor is heard that our beverage company like is not becoming cool, they don't like sell a lot of beverages, not a lot of those energy drinks, then basically people can like sell more of those stocks and then invest them into other companies. The value of that beverage company will then drop when this happens. And it's just a game if you think about it. So to sell stocks, to buy or invest into other stocks, this is also what basically Warren Buffett and Larry Fink did. And you know, those are the winners of that game. Basically, the, these guys have billions of dollars. They even have some like investment companies that like take care of trillions of dollars, which is insane. Like. I just researched it. There's this company called BlackRock and it's an American multinational investment management corporation based in New York. It was founded by Larry Fink and <laughs> just think about it. It like it takes care basically of more than 8 trillion US dollars and it's, that just means that they have such a huge amount of power and they have so much influence on governments, on other companies, on so many people. It's just insane. And you know, I was also thinking, so those are the winners, if you call them. Of course, they are losing because climate change is also going to hit them. Like bad air pollution is also going to hit them, of course. Like there's no way around this. But then you also got the millions of people who are losing in this game. You know, people who lost their money, who lost their means of to live, kind of. You know, I was also thinking that you can speculate on food and this is just ridiculous. Like <laughs> people from the future, if we ever get to a saner future, they will just think how ridiculous was that. It's like how we look back to the middle age like those guys yeah they were shitting on the streets and so on and they will look back and think like how could people just believe in money and how could they believe in wall street and stock market and couldn't they see that this creates so many problems and like so many people are suffering because of that game that those people are playing like think about if you can speculate on food that means that if the price of food goes higher, then millions of people won't be able to like afford it anymore. Just think about like and keep remembering that there are millions of people whose wages are less than one dollars per day, basically. And these are struggling to survive. And other people like Larry Fink and Warren Buffett are billionaires. <laughs> like what the fuck is wrong? So. <laughs> Let's try to understand this craziness a little bit more because that leads us to the next point, basically making money out of money. That's what they do. So let's imagine a guy called Gold Boss and he has a safe and he has some guards that take care of that um, safe, that protect this safe basically. And I'm not able to keep my gold coins at home because I'm thinking maybe other can steal it. So basically Gold Boss is saying that Aaron, you can store your gold coins at my safe and I will take care of it, but I will charge you with 3% of your amount of gold coins. So he's basically making money out of protecting money from being stolen. Like how does that sound? <laughs> And then he has an idea. So basically he's thinking that if I lend out 400 gold coins to a person and I say they need to pay back that amount of money with a 40% tax. So basically 140% of what I gave them. Then I gold boss will make a profit. In other words, a poor guy takes these 400 golden coins 
but then he has to pay back 560 golden coins, all because of the rule Goldboss just invented. Goldboss relies on a trust that the poor guy will be able to pay him back the 560 gold coins within a previously agreed upon period of time. The agreement may have been like 10 gold coins per month. That means that in 56 months the poor guy paid back the loan, the 400 gold coins he took plus 140% interest. But there are two huge issues with this way of taxing making business. As you may have noticed, Goldboss never had any golden coins to start with. So he is using other people's coins to start his business. So basically there is a son of a bitch right there. And the second point is that he asks for more coins that he lent out. So he takes back more than what he had. These gold coins that he accepts as interest must come from somewhere. But from where? So what Goldboss does is that he lends out more and more of those loans because he wants his business to grow but then he runs low on gold coins because of course if he gives out more and more he eventually runs out of them. So he has another idea. He comes up with a piece of paper and he's telling to people that basically this paper is worth of 400 golden coins. You use it the same way that you use gold coins but without having to haul around all of that weight. This way he no longer has to give out gold coins but his safe still has to contain all of the gold coins that the papers represent, right? Right. He has a budget within his safe that he now represents with these papers. It's not a big advantage for now as he still relies on gold coins to represent these invented papers. However, as soon as these papers become popular as a currency unit, he can pretty much print this paper without having the golden coins that he started with. Really? Really. And it's still being done this way today. And you can check it out, you can read more about it. It's called Fiat Money and yeah, on this article you can read more about it. So let's get back. Remember the first guy who deposited gold coins into Goldboss safe? He now wants them back but they are physically spread around the world and have even lost some of their value as there are now more paper currencies than the gold coins they supposedly represent. Give that guy some paper and let the party begin. Goldboss can now print papers and give them to people as debt as he did before with coins and people must give back even more papers the interest again as he did before. The only difference is that Goldboss can now print new currency whenever he needs more to lend. It should be very easy to see that this is not a sustainable system as it creates something that we call inflation. And inflation is explained here. So for example if we use gold coins as a currency and then like it would rain for 40 days gold coins all the time. Then of course these gold coins would be worth nothing anymore. Like people would sweep it out of their homes. And the same thing with money. So if everybody has a printing machine and could print as much money as they want and then they want to have like 55 jets and 34 yachts then there is not enough for everybody. And maybe also people would like yeah since they can print their own money they would probably not go to work. So that means that no one works and no new stuff is being produced and no one would be able to buy anything with the now massively inflated currency. Another explanation of inflation is here. So basically let's think about the ancient Rome and the tribe leaders wanted to build more stuff more rapidly but they didn't have enough gold coins to pay more people to make this happen. So what they thought about doing is they like collected all the gold coins, they then melted them down and put some metal in it so that it basically has the same stored value but there are more coins now to pay people with. But what happened is that people like who got paid more they also could buy more and then like the woman who sells chicken, she said we have no more chickens because some people who came before you bought them all. So it basically created a lot of problems. Supply could no longer satisfy demand. The pasta maker says, damn, no more chickens. Now I can't buy food with all of the coins I made. That's pointless. 
the gal growing chickens is also pissed off because she can't buy repairs for her barn and so on. But then an important point is that eventually one of those guys who sells something realizes that aha uh -huh, the demand is now greater because people have more coins to spend so I can just raise my prices and then I can still sell all of what I sell but closer to the speed that I can make those things that I sell and with a higher profit too. So basically he raises the prices and then everybody else does it too. So eventually everything will cost more but since people now have a lot more currency the effect of these higher prices will be almost like it was before the new coins came into existence. In other words the market restabilizes. They have now more currency to play with but the stuff they can buy with now costs also more. An important point to consider here is that the workers who got their hands on the new coins before the inflation were the ones who profited the most out of this because they could afford more. Thus at the start of any inflationary period the ones who get their hands on the newly minted coins or newly printed papers first are the ones who profit the most. And since today's governments, national banks or both in cooperation are like the ancient Roman leaders and gold boss and can create currency, they give rise to these inflationary periods that affect all of us but mainly make some rich people even richer. And now also something interesting is that if we were to count the total coin, paper and digital currency in the world, the number would be somewhere around 5 trillion dollars but that only represents less than 10 percent of the total money in the world what how is that like as you can see that's basically the real money and that is all imaginary money so how is that this is explained here remember the gold coins that gold boss landed out to different people and then he made a lot of money out of that he made a business out of that the same thing is now with paper money so Someone deposits $100 into the bank and starts the craziness. The bank will then lend out that $100 to another person but it charges 3% of interest rate. And then that other person needs to pay back the $100 plus the 3% of interest rate. So she pays back $103 and then the bank lends out another $100 also with an interest rate of 3% and then that person also has to pay back those $100 plus the interest rate. So with another $3 so the bank is getting richer and richer and richer by all those different transactions. As the story repeats the bank makes more and more money out of the $100 that it did not own. Imagine how much money the bank will make after years of loaning out the same money with interest. So and now the thing with that imaginary money and real money is that basically if I deposit those $100 to the bank and the bank lends it out to another person then basically we got $200 of purchasing power but basically there are only $100 there, right? because I just gave them $100 and they gave it further to that other person. So basically I have the $100 and the other one has $100. So <laughs> that's, that's how you can explain how, why there's so much imaginary money but only so little real money basically. It's also explained here like I have it stored in the bank while she has it in her pocket from a very simple transaction like this in reality. Money rules make it much much more complex, the consumption power doubles. However, we can spend the $100 at the same time since there's only $100 of actual physical money there. The bank relies on me keeping that money stored in the bank while the other person needs to spend that amount so the bank lies to me about having my money. In fact the bank does not need to create any new money as it just spins the same money around making profits out of it all and the whole time promoting false purchasing power. Of course there are more rules to this transactional game as you can see in this video but this is the basic idea. In our simplified example above the physical money was $100 but the total money purchasing power quickly became $200. 
This example helps in explaining how total money is always much higher than the real physical currency. If an alien species would look at us financially, they would figure out and they would see that we have a purchasing power of around 60 trillion US dollars on paper, but in actuality there is only around 5 trillion dollars to spend. And if everyone in the world would go to their bank tomorrow to withdraw their money, they would find that the banks don't have it. However, if the people who owe money to the banks were to pay back their debt to the banks tomorrow, then the banks would have plenty of money to pay everyone's withdrawal demands. So just keep in mind that there is a huge difference between the physical money supply and the purchasing power, the total money. The money that physically exists, the real stuff, is called currency, while the total money supply is more simply called money. It's more important to understand the difference because the terms are often misused interchangeably and it's quite difficult to avoid doing that even for this book. And let's continue. Things get much more messy when new currency, remember real money, is created via the central boss-like banks. You know the central banks like Federal Reserve Bank or also there's the European Central Bank. These banks create new currency, digital or otherwise, and inject them into its children banks. Those banks now have more currency available for their needs which will indeed inflate the purchasing power because now both that girl and I can have our $100 to spend at the same time as the bank suddenly has the extra currency for that to happen. The banks can also lend out more money to new creditors. Resultingly, this new currency promotes the creation of even more money, the non-real stuff. Central banks like the Federal Reserve Bank or the European Central Bank create currencies and the consumer level banks create money out of that currency. All while the entire money creation is triggering inflation across the entire system. Rising prices, reducing the worth of your stored values, pissing people off, etc. And since boss banks have the power to create this kind of inflation, they can also try to stabilize it. So to cope with inflation, the boss bank has the power to intervene by declaring to all banks we are basically like increasing the interest rates on new loans, so we make them higher and thus the banks will begin advertising to people, so yeah, we are now also raising the interest rate. And this causes people to borrow less money, thus spending less, and so works to stabilize inflation as it reduces the overall flow of money. It is similar to how earlier people raised the prices for their pastas and chickens in order to slow down consumption demand. And if you think that's crazy, you'll probably love this. So when consumption slows down too much due to the boss bank's games, it creates the opposite of inflation. And you probably already guessed it, deflation. When people consume less, they move less money around the system and since everything is monetarily interconnected today, that negatively affects salaries, employment and production brought about by the resulting decreases in demand and so on. So I hope you guess it, like if people can spend less money, then maybe some businesses will get broke and they don't have enough money to pay their like um, employees and so on. So of course this is a bad thing because we live in a world where we must consume like crazy or else the money game will fail and break down. So when the boss bank sees their potential growing, you may be able to guess what it does. It simply creates yet more currency and reduces the interest rates for banks so that more money can enter the system. This back and forth loop continues again and again and again and these cycles generally occur every 5 to 8 years. Like the Roman kings and merchants of the past, today's kings may successfully stabilize the economy for a while with each of these cycles, but since it invents money all the time and people rarely succeed in becoming debt free, the entire world is in a perpetual state of increasing consumption and growing debt that perhaps can never be paid off. Now that's crazy. So, 
I hope you kind of got the idea and you can also read it for yourself again. Um, you can also watch this 30 minute video from Ray Dalio. I can also highly recommend it. And yeah, basically the idea is that those central banks, the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve Bank, those banks can influence the market. They can like control it a little bit by this um, like interest rate that they pass on to the smaller banks. And then those smaller banks pass on that interest rate to the normal people basically. And this is like, it's a completely insane game if you think about it, because in the end, the entire world is in a perpetual state of increasing consumption and growing debt that can perhaps never be paid off. So again, please don't get lost in these rules. The important thing to recognize is that it is all about moving stuff around and taking advantage of services. This all has become so incredibly complicated because they continually add so many new rules that are very dependent on other rules, people's behavior, resource scarcity and so on. And of course, more and more of these rules have become decoupled from reality. Wow, so as mentioned earlier, with the advent of mechanization, People found themselves able to produce even more stuff, thus allowing a growing amount of stuff to be moved around. Today, your food plate may include five items from five different tribes. It looks like a great system that allows us to enjoy luxury, comfort, opportunity, but it's quite naive to ignore two very important aspects of all of this. And the first one is that remember the King Asshole the third who basically wanted slaves, lions or whatever, exotic dishes and women. He was able to express his distorted values because of the marketplace. The same goes today. The more assholes, meaning people with distorted values, created by a frenzy of consumption, the more such ways to satisfy these clients because satisfying them means profit for others. And the second thing is, I think it is right to say that the only reason you might find a certain wine from France amazing or a food dish made of five different food types from five different tribes as delicious or a rare painting as gorgeous, aren't all paintings good or bad rare, is all due to today's consumerism culture. It is the advertising, the ideas created in people's heads to want these exotic things. We are used to thinking that the ability to see some polar bears in a warm climate, in a zoo, is such a great advantage for our own entertainment or whatever, but these are nothing more than projected values from a consumerist world. So that was it for this video. In the next video we are going to look into the most commonly used goods and services that are out there. Most of them also people have on a daily basis. For example a tasty hamburger or yummy chocolate and delicious coffee. We are going to look at electronics like the new iPhone for example. We are going to look at shiny jewelry and fashionable clothes and also another thing. Because like if we learn more about those goods and services and the story behind them, like how they are made, then we get a much clearer portrait or picture of today's system. So I look forward to the next video. See you then and as always, I'm just gonna say take care and much love.